This show contains discussion of general investment strategies for information purposes only and should not be construed as investment advice. Diversification cannot eliminate the risk of investment losses. It's time for the Money Puzzle Podcast. Podcast. With good conversations and realistic solutions to the money puzzles we all face every day. Join your hosts, chartered financial consultant and financial advisor Robert Edgen and financial advisor Brian Johnson to learn the money tips and tricks you need to achieve the financial confidence you deserve and the future that you dream of. Now let's get this show started. Hi there, hello, and welcome to the Money Puzzle Podcast. I am Robert Edgen, and I'll be your guide for the ride for the next few minutes. This is the place for candid conversations about money, investing, finance, and all of the other pieces of the money puzzle that you have to figure out so you can have the financial confidence you deserve and the future that you dream of. This is episode 59, and I'm flying solo today, kind of, because I've got a special guest joining me through Zoom, all the way from Oregon today. Melvin Young is a serial entrepreneur. He has a lot of things going on in the Oregon region to help other entrepreneurs get involved in the world of insurance, tax, and finance. And Melvin is a recruiter in the insurance industry. I came across Melvin at an industry event where I heard him speak on the main platform about some of the adversities that he has had to deal with in the insurance and financial industries as a black foundational American. You know, we were talking him and I about some of the challenges that he faces versus the challenges that I face. And sure, a lot of them are the same, but some of the things that Melvin has had to deal with, a lot of the things I didn't even know were challenges to be dealt with, or there are things that I've never come across in my life, in my part of the country. So hearing Melvin talk uh, at this event about some of the things that he's had to endure was pretty moving, was pretty inspirational, especially the way that Melvin consistently overcomes all challenges by focusing on what's important, by maintaining the right attitude and really working on the things that he can control. So Melvin's got some great words of wisdom to share with us today. I know that you're going to get a lot of value out of it. So let's go ahead and get into this conversation with Melvin Young. All right, everybody, we're back, and I've got my special guest on with us now, uh, Melvin Young out of Salem, Oregon. Melvin is the president and owner of Mode Wealth Advisors. Uh, he is an MLGA, which is a recruiter for an insurance company. Now, Melvin, I actually saw you speak at an industry event um, that was my first exposure to you, and you gave an amazing talk uh, which gave me some new perspective on some of the challenges of the industry that personally I've never had to deal with. Um, but it also seemed like it was a little, uh, a little fortuitous. I mean, it was like almost like you were telling the future a little bit about what we were getting to in the world uh, because I saw you back in February of this year, right mm -hmm. before all of the craziness ensued and, and the world shut down. But Melvin, thank you so much for joining me. It's great. Yeah, of course. Glad to be here. So now, are you uh, are you actually in Salem, Oregon, or, or or where exactly is Salem? Yeah, Salem, Oregon is a uh, fifty four miles south of Portland. Okay, so I think it's fifty four, maybe a little bit less than that, but at least where I'm at in South Salem, it's about fifty four miles south. So, uh, not even a bedroom community. It's kind of weird. We don't have our own media. We share Portland media, but completely different experience in Salem than it is in Portland. Really? Yeah, so do you spend yeah. most of your time in Salem? Are you in Portland? Because yesterday I chatted with you, you were in Portland. I was in Portland. Yeah, I've got agents and advisors up there. So sometimes I hit up I-5 to head up that direction. Strategically, traffic can be a nuance or a nuisance. But um, but yeah, so I spend the vast majority of my time in Salem. But I do get up to Portland every once in a while, probably once a week. Yeah, awesome. Now, Maybe we could just touch real quick on your history and background and yeah. we'll share some stories and, and you know why I wanted to have this conversation with you. But yeah. you're in the insurance industry for the most part and the advisor industry. And maybe I'm not really a, a explaining or giving full credit. Can you give us just a quick, you know, history and background? You know, what is the Melvin Young story? How did you get to where you are? Yeah. Well, I uh, grew up in a little town called Beaumont, Texas, which is essentially where the hurricane just went. Uh, 
mm-hmm. that we just it wasn't what was the name of that hurricane I forget was it bob what was it anyway One of um, that hurricane right there where texas meets louisiana um that's where beaumont is right on the border beaumont is more louisiana than texas though um, okay you don't have much of a of a cajun accent well i don't but i have people in my family that do that's yeah. for sure um but I, I, I was raised by a stickler for the English language. So he corrected me when I spoke incorrectly. So that's the reason why I sound the way I do. But yeah, I grew up in Beaumont, Texas. My dad's job was displaced. I'm mentioning that because it has a lot to do with the way I think, why I think the way that I do. Uh, we grew up, I tell people, like Cosby's, the Cosby's light. You know, uh, we didn't have a brownstone in New York, but we did have a nice little chunk of property in in southeast texas uh nice ranch style home got go-karts and things like that for christmas things were great for us and then when i was 14 years old my dad's job merged with another company he was an engineer college graduate um we were displaced and they gave him what they called an educational package my mother um, is from portland oregon stepmother's from portland oregon so we moved up to portland oregon and my dad went from being an engineer to a janitor at the high school that I was at. Oh, wow. So uh, that transition was one that gave me a lot of perspective. My father being a, uh, an, an employee, I sort of created this really fierce, independent spirit after going through that, just really never wanting to be in a position for someone else to be able to take my livelihood away. So I'm... Uh, saw that but my father did something really 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 awesome he he really entered hero them in my head at least he went from being the janitor to uh got his degree uh well his advanced degree and he ended up teaching the very thing that displaced him which was autocad oh wow my father was a freehand draftsman and so computers could do of course what he did and so he ended up teaching students how to use the autocad program as a teacher at the high school that I attended. So pretty cool stuff. Very cool. So he, uh, so you guys moved across the country. Yeah. And, uh, uh, different, different, different world, different world. Yeah. You know? And you're still out there. You're, you're, you're still close. Still here. Still here. Parents are actually here too. So we're all here. Uh, so my immediate family's all in Portland and I live in Salem and uh, the rest of my family's in Beaumont, Texas, Southwest Louisiana. So how long have you been doing now what you're doing? Because I met you in the, you know, in the, in the world of insurance, but mm-hmm. really you do more than that, right? But how yeah. did you get into this industry and get, and get to be doing this? For sure. I, you know, I, I started out selling life insurance door to door. Well, brief history. I was an underwriter, an auto underwriter for a large company. Um, then one day, one of their top salespeople calls me back and says, Melvin, what the hell are you doing? You're, you're the worst underwriter. And I said, well, what do you mean? He goes, well, people like you, like you should be selling stuff. What are you being an under? But you know, I was still dealing with the demon of having, uh, being raised in a very secure environment. And I knew what he was saying, but I, I was unwilling at that time at 23, 24 to take that step. So I left that company as an underwriter to start my entrepreneurial life and was a journeyman life insurance salesman for some six years Had MDRT level production did really well, but you can imagine, I got to see a lot of America. I I would actually journey out of state and sell life insurance door to door. So a lot of my perspective and my views were formed by understanding everyday America in a very personal way from being inside of people's houses. Yeah, uh, six years of door-to-door sales. I mean, that yep. is uh, that is a college education. Pl- I mean, yep. that is a that that is a doctorate level education on getting to know people and relationships and and sales, uh, and to be able to do it for six years. Uh, to me, just uh, I mean, that that blows me away. That that is a lot of hard work. Yes, it was. Yes, it was, and it was unsustainable. At least for me, I had two small children. We're in the process of adopting a third. Uh, a lot happened during those six years as a result of the amount of hours and time and effort and energy. It really got me to the place and the ideology that I have now. Yes, life insurance and insurance is foundational in my approach and, and the way that I view financial services. Uh, but what I've learned is that 
when you pigeonhole yourself with one specific product, it disallows you from being able to help people in very complex ways, which may be more beneficial for them. So um, my philosophy now is, and what I have now is a holistic business planning practice. And I essentially help business owners take their next best step. Whatever that step is, we help them with that. Yeah, and that's through Mode Wealth Advice. That's through Mode Wealth, correct. So, and, and you told me uh, something that I thought was really cool yesterday. You said, you know, I'm not in the wealth management business. No. Right? And, and why is that? Yeah, I think, I think a lot of advisors, well, most of them that I know, they're always talking about getting AUM, getting assets under management. And I don't think that tells the story, or at least it doesn't imply the correct focus. Um, I believe if you do it the right way and you take everything into consideration and you really understand where a business owner wants and desires to go, you need to be in the wealth creation business because that's what we can do is we help create wealth. And so I look at myself as a part of the business owners that I work with as part of their story, as part of their journey. So I always say everybody wants to be there when you get to 10, 12 million, but who was there for you when you were at 200,000 with $150,000 of overhead trying to get to 1 million. Sure. Right. So if I can be part of that journey, helping business owners go from, from extremely small to sustainable, then getting from sustainable to having massive wealth, uh, isn't that big of a jump. And most people that understand how business works know that. So I spent a lot of time doing foundational business planning for businesses and helping them get to that first million. You uh, are a true believer in entrepreneurship. So 100% to help business owners yeah. and to, you know, to help those entrepreneurs create wealth, uh, you know, is, is important. And um, actually, and I, I, I read you a quote that I found from you yesterday and you're like, man, I don't even remember saying that. You must say a lot of really smart things. I'm going to say that. But, you know, you, you said in a quote, you said, most people think that if they have a job, a nine to five, and they show up every day that they have security. But the reality is they're not as secure as someone who has the skill or true ability to do sales or find the value in people. If you do, you'll always be employed. So, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and that, that comes from, again, the kid that saw his dad have relative safety and got the go-karts and, you know, got the wonderful Christmases and had the blessing of having a nuclear family. And then one day I come home and there's a bunch of UPS boxes on the ground. We're going to Portland. We're moving to Portland. Um, and then when we get there, your dad's going to be studying all day for his master's and working at your high school, sweeping up floors. I believe that people that have fierce independence should always investigate entrepreneurship. And I even believe that people who are employees should investigate, I guess the term now for young kids is a side hustle. Side it hustle. was just hustle when I grew up. It wasn't a side hustle. <laughs> but, but you should have something that allows you to express all the benefits of self-employment because as an employee, um, Essentially, you're an extension of that business, right? So I just got finished telling my advisors, and this is a simple metaphor for people to understand why employment can be a detriment to your future success if you don't put it in its place and if it's not a step to help you get close to where you want to go. Um, we've all worked for Fortune 500 companies or large companies at least, and I always say they're like a big boat. They're a big boat, and they're going their direction. And as an employee... What they do is they'll tell you, they'll say, here are the things you can't do. And they'll tell you why you can't do it. And then there's underwriting. And then there's all these rules and regulations that you can't do. Here's the reality. You're not a big boat. You're a motorboat. You're a very small boat. You're agile. You can run laps around them. And even bigger, they were once you. Right. So if you're a little motorboat and they're a big, big, huge Titanic type vessel, why would you follow their directions? Because you have flexibilities in your uniqueness and in your mobility that once allowed them to get to where they're at. That's right. So it's, it's important that you understand that. And so what people do is they look and they see the big boat and they go, yes, but they don't see the flexibility. What do you call those things? I'm, I'm forgetting the type of boat. The type of boats 
where you pull something on the back and you the little bouncy thing. What is that called? <laughs> You're talking about like like tubing or ski boat tubing. or the jet skis or yeah, tubing. But what are the boats called that pulls the tube? Why can I not remember that right now? I just call it a ski boat. I'm not sure. Ski boat, whatever. Or, yeah. or, a, power, or a power boat. Power boat. Yeah, you're a power boat. You're flexible, you're mobile, you're agile, you're all those things. So why are you taking direction for someone that doesn't have the talent and the agility that you do? So yeah, sure. I think that's an excellent metaphor and that makes total sense. I mean, you know, and a lot of people get on that on that kick of, you know, if I'm on that big ship, well, then I've got security. Right. And kind of like you found out, you know, with you with your dad, that just because you're on a big ship doesn't mean that you have security. The Titanic did sink. But really, before one of those big ships sink, the first thing they're going to do is, you know, they're going to get rid of excess weight. You know? Well, I'll, I'll take it one step further. They don't actually sink. They typically keep going. What they do is they bring you to some strange place and they leave you there. And you no longer have the wherewithal or the skill set of the acumen to get to where you could go because you gave all of your value and your vital resources to that boat, which stranded you on some island with vicious dogs. <laughs> so <laughs> that's, that's what happens. And, and it's really hard to procure success on an island that you've never been before because you put everything that you knew, all of your luggage and, and, and everything is, is still going with that boat. So, that's, that's the reason why for me to understand entrepreneurship, even if it's only a part of you, is important to figure out who you are. I think it should be a part of everybody's journey, even the employee. I love um, the idea of that. And you're right. When I was growing up, yeah, we didn't have side hustles. We were just out hustling. Hustling. But really, it's the same thing. You know, you were yep. finding ways to, um, you know, to be creative and make make revenue in different ways, you know, to bring in some income. Uh, you know, so you opened up Mode Wealth. Yes. And, and, you know, as a part of Mode Wealth, um, you say that there are five things that need to be successful. And you, you reference, you know, leverage financing, posture, leads, and systems. And, mm -hmm. you know, when I was reading that, it was, you know, it was for, you know, advisors, you know, if you're going to be a, you know, a successful advisor, which really you own your own little business, if you're an advisor, you know, but those are kind of the, the same keys for all small businesses, you know, all people with side hustles, you all need to have leverage, financing, posture, leads, and systems. So, you know, how important are those things? How do you teach those things to the folks that you work with? Yeah, I, I, we always start with, with what I, I'm realizing. I say certain things over and over again, um, but make the big things small. I say this all the time. So uh, let, let, me, let me break it down. Let me use... There's several companies that exist that have this type of structure. So let's take your multi-line company. So a multi-line company or multi-line insurance company is a company that sells home, auto life. Okay. So that's big. Those are individual industries. Those are individual markets. And the company's saying, hey, this is what you need to do. And then they give you some arbitrary scorecard. And they say, hey, we want you to do it at this level. Okay. There's a lot of organizations that are that way. In that environment, how you make the big things small is you create a seamless process that occupies all of those spaces in a holistic way, in a deliverable that the client understands and finds value. So obviously there's lots of disclosures and lots of nuance to how to do that, but you can do that in any single business because the reason why you want to have multiple products is because for profitability reasons, if property and casualty numbers are off, you have life insurance and so on and so forth. But the process that provides value makes that big thing small, not just for the customer, but also for the insurance agent or advisor. Sure. Because instead of having individual conversations about what all these very specific things do, you find out what's important to them. You figure out what they most desire, figure out what their lifestyle is, and then you procure a deliverable that provides them with that. And insurance, ironically, can answer almost any question. There's nothing that somebody can tell you that they care about that insurance doesn't provide some sort of solution for, which is why it's foundational in my practice. So do you think, you know, for young folks out there or really for anybody who is, um, you know, maybe got laid off or, yeah. you know, 
COVID changed their whole you know, career path. Do you think that the insurance industry or the financial industry, are those still good places to look? I'm going to say 100% yes, but I'll also say that in times like these, it's not necessarily the industry that you enter. It's the mindset that you enter it with. You know, it's, there's money being made everywhere right now. And, and as a business advisor, I'm seeing people who are thriving as a result of COVID. And I'm seeing people who are majorly impacted as a result. Um, but even the people that are majorly impacted are teeing themselves up for future success because they're able to identify ways that their businesses were maybe not as efficient. And the problem or the issue of COVID created the time to fix those problems. Sure. So outside of the just natural problem of having, having a pandemic hit your business right at the end of the first quarter, I mean, extremely problematic as far as profitability for the year, depending on your business model. Right. But the time that it's created for a lot of people to re-engineer their purpose around something less distracting because I think the world is quieter now, not to quote I am legend, but there's a scene in there where ladies who's the, at that moment in the movie, you think she's one of the only female survivors. Uh, she told John legend that something was going to happen. And he said, well, how do you know? She says, well, I can hear God because the earth is quieter now. If you listen, and I th it's a weird quote, but I think about that all the time and I relate it to what we're going through now is with so much going on, with so many things to be distracted by, we kind of left a lot of our previous distractions behind us. And so anybody that's advancing through this new economy is doing so with that newfound time to get close to the person they want to be, which I think is super awesome. Well, and it, they're probably attacking it with that, that right attitude, that positive mindset, which is one of the things that I have really enjoyed hearing from you and listening to you talk about. You've had some pretty tough stuff that you've had to deal with, challenges that um, you know, others have not had to deal with, but you approach them as not a problem, but an opportunity, or that's the way that it comes across. So can you, can you talk about how important that is to you and what that's done for you? Absolutely. I, I feel like the vast majority of Americans have lost their purpose, just quite frankly. And, and the reason why they've lost it is because they've willingly given it away to marketers. <laughs> so what happens is if you don't know what your purpose is, what happens is media, um, Facebook, Twitter, whatever it is, Sure. becomes your new mission. And so you're getting fed information that you hear, but you're not necessarily doing the due diligence of discerning by way of your purpose, it's value in your life or not. So you can hear something now because you're living a purposeless life. And it feels so uniquely real that you form an opinion that you might share with the world that is based on nothing but feeling, nothing but feeling. And so my mantra for the last three years has been purpose over opinion. And the reason is, is because I find that the more grounded you are in your purpose, number one, the less other people's opinions matter, mm -hmm. but the slower you are to speak your own. Because you start to see, because of what you're trying to do, that everybody simply speaks from their current understanding of their own reality. Okay. So with that being said, as a black person, I, I call myself a black foundational American. Uh, and the reason why I call myself that is because, quite frankly, as a black American, as a descendant of slaves, we built a lot of America through free labor, period. That's a fact. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I believe I'm a black foundational American and that's who I am. But I do get a lot of pushback and people say, you know, you know, how do you feel about Donald Trump? Not to get political, but 
It's really simple, guys. Donald Trump does what Donald Trump does. Well, what do you mean? He acts from a position of his own knowledge. Well, he's trying to build a wall. Well, of course he is. You know why? Because he's a builder. He builds hotels. Well, he's trying to cut this and cut that and privatize this and privatize that. Well, of course he's trying to do that. Of course he's trying to reduce taxation for corporations because he owns several of them. That's right. So when you start to stop thinking about things from a position of what you feel about what someone else is doing because you do it differently and you start to examine why they do it from their shoes, things start to make a little more sense because that's what we're all doing, trying to make sense of it. But then we all have opinions about why other people do it that way. How many clips do you see about people, you know, that say that they're against guns, but when you ask them a question about a gun, and this is not pro-gun or not, this is just simply a statement. They say, oh, well, an AR-14, you go, well, it's not an AR-14, it's an AR-15. <laughs> oh, well, yeah, but you get it. They're opining on something that they actually don't know anything about. So, of course, someone that's never held or shot a gun, rifle, or shotgun is going to be scared of it because they simply don't know. And so I approach everything from that position. The reason why people don't understand what it's like to be a black person in America is simply because they're not black. I would agree with that. And I appreciate so much just your, your perspective and your outlook. And, um, you know, I try to, the mantra that I try to live by is don't be judgmental, be curious. You yeah. know, instead of judging why they think that way, yeah. maybe you don't agree with it whatsoever. Maybe it's not right, but start by being curious about why do they think the way they do? You know, how are they seeing the world? You know, try to see it a little bit through their eyes. So, um, you know, it's, it's great yeah. to hear you, you know, say that same thing. And it does make a bit of difference. And of course, it's hard to not be judgmental when you hear people saying things you completely disagree with every single day, everywhere. But, you know, if you approach it from that attitude, which you do, um, I think it makes a world of difference now. So how, I mean, in Oregon, you know, compared to Colorado Springs, I don't really know how it is, um, you know, but, you know, as a, as a black business owner and a man who has to go out and do these things, you know, we were talking a little bit yesterday, you know, I used to do some door to door sales stuff. My biggest fear ever was that someone was just going to say no. Right. Or, or worst case, they were just going to shut the door on me without talking, you know, and that's, that was my fear because that's all that I had known. You know, you told me a story, if you don't mind sharing it and if you, yeah. uh, if you do, but you told me a story about having a gun pulled on you one time when you were trying to help families and, you know, make sure their life insurance is taken care of. Yeah. So how, what, what, how do you deal with those kinds of things? Yeah, I'll, I'll tell that story. I, first I'll say this though. I'll say that, you know, one thing that white America doesn't seem to get, at least I haven't heard it verbalized yet is that black Americans see it all. And what I mean is, when I walk into a home and they're surprised I'm black, I can see it on their face. Hmm. It's a nuance, but it's, it's, it's something that you just are able to discern as a person living in this skin. When I walk in and they don't want me to be there, I can feel it, just like a white person would be able to feel it if they were somewhere where they weren't wanted. If I walk in and it's racism, racism has a very specific, specific feeling kind of a blend of both of those, but it's also, it, it makes a lot of people uh, immobile. They just blank space and they're just staring at you because they don't know how to verbalize their irrational thoughts. So it just causes a very awkward moment. And so I'm saying that to say, that if you're in my skin and you're walking around and you're trying to sell things, you're gonna see things and someone who's not in your skin would never have that feeling simply because they're not you. So they're going to walk in and they'll say, well, okay, maybe they don't like me. Or you're going to worry about, are they a duck or are they a beaver? Because I don't want to wear a beaver shirt if they're going to be an Oregon duck. You're going to worry about little things like that, right? Maybe maybe it's religion. Maybe, maybe you don't want to speak religion or you don't want to speak politics. But to have something go before you in every single conversation and have it be a deal breaker is something that you have to be very purposeful about working around. 
So what I found, you know, is that I don't lead with skin color. I always tell people I want me being a black foundational American to be the least interesting thing about me. Why? Because I'm so grounded in my purpose that my skin color is a reflection of where my ancestors have been. But I want to be the personification of what we are and what we should have always been. And the only way that I can do that is to set down this coat that I'm wearing and move closer towards my purpose. Now, that doesn't mean that I don't, don't identify and understand the pain. I just refuse to be defined by it. So, yeah, the, the story you're speaking of is uh, when I was very early in my industry and in the career when I was doing door-to-door -door sales, uh, I went to a town called, uh, well, it's Dallas, Oregon. And for those of you that are in or around Oregon, you may know that Dallas, Oregon has a reputation of being a racist little town. And uh, yeah, so anyway, I've got my little briefcase and my suit and tie because that's the way you did it in 2006. That's the way you did it. That's <laughs> right. We yeah. all have briefcases. I all have briefcases, you know, knocked on the door. Um, and uh, his, well, I could, I could, well, I got several stories, but I guess I'll stick with the one that I told you. <laughs> Um, he answers the door and he's just completely bald, just like I am right now. He had tats on his neck. Um, he had this really gaudy ring with the dragon on it. And uh, basically the type of person, if you were to open the door and you were to look like me, you'd have some level of concern about. It, okay. So I looked at him and he looked at me and anyway, so we start walking over towards uh, the kitchen table and I look down to the right and I see a Confederate flag folded military style. I see all types of, uh, essentially it was all Nazi paraphernalia, um, lots of different Nazi paraphernalia. And right above his couch, he had the Dallas, Oregon courthouse with a noose hanging from it. Oh. So I'm there trying to sell this guy insurance and I walk into a, a landmine of hate basically. And I remember sitting down and him sitting down at the table and then my voice gets shaky and, and, and he didn't actually pull out a gun on me. What he did was he had several guns right behind him. And there was a point in the conversation where he reached down and he just moved it. Heart skips a beat. I'm like, what's going on? Is he going to, you know, what's going to happen? But anyway, I did my presentation. I did my presentation just like I would have done it for anybody. Um, it might've been a little shaky. I might've been a little nervous. Uh, I did my best to mask it. I just told myself I'm there for a reason. I don't know what it is, um, but I did it. And at the time I was selling mortgage protection, which is a product that covers the home in case they were to pass away. Went through the whole process, got to the very end, asked him straight up, you know, does this sound like something that you want? Partially thinking, let me do some kind of weird, hard clothes so he tells me no so I can get it out of here. No. He said, sounds good. He left me with his guns and his paraphernalia to go to the back. Don't know what the hell was going to happen. He comes back with his checkbook, sends me out in a check. We start walking to the door. Um, and there's one part I didn't tell in the story that you heard. But we start walking to the door. Um, I said, great. I actually asked him. I said, hey, sir, I'm sorry, I've got to ask you. I said, I'm in your home and I'm seeing things that make you, me feel like you don't like black people. Yeah. And his words to me were, you were here to talk to me about life insurance, not here to date my daughter. That's what he said. Huh. Here's my point. I mean, I left there, I got in my car and I cried, man. I was just a mess. I was like, wow. You know, I was crying mostly because I was, furious with the level of obvious racism in the environment. But I ended up calling my wife and chatting with her. And I told her the story front to back, exactly how I told you. I told her about the table, about the news, about everything, the guns. And after she listened to me tell the story, she said, well, did you take the app? Mm -hmm. And so I said, well, yeah. And she said, well, that's why you were there. Yeah. And so that was the foundational piece to me understanding. I didn't want to do it. No more than Jackie Robinson wanted to play for all white crowds and get spit on, but he did it. And by way of doing it, he fulfilled his purpose. Well, me and this gentleman are now actually pretty good friends. 
Oh. You know, I was able to play a foundational key. I haven't been to his house. I don't know what his house looks like. But I know when he has an insurance question, he calls me. Wow. I know that. So purpose over opinion. Now, if I would have walked to that same door and I would have been highly opinionated about what I've seen, first of all, I wouldn't have went in. And I'm, I'm, not, I'm not advocating for doing something unsafe. I'm not even saying what I was doing was smart. I'm just saying neither is starting a business the vast majority of the time. Yeah. Somebody's always going to tell you what you can't do and how you can't do it. Sure. But the idea that he stepped out of the way to allow me to walk into his home, that was enough for me to believe that maybe I'm going to be able to write insurance. So I've written his cars, his autos, I mean, his home, um, his, his, his wife, him, everybody. I've written his children and actually had conversations with his children about how radical he is. <laughs> but there it is, man. It's, 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 it's just a very simple thing that when you're living a life focused on what it is you're supposed to do, people's opinions about things that happened before they met you are irrelevant because you're what's going to happen. Not what's was yeah. what was you must have a, uh, an extremely uh, strong sense of purpose. You know, so if you don't mind me asking, uh, you know, what do you see as your purpose? Hmm. Well, I, I want to be light in the darkness. I want to uh, basically show people. I want to be a defender of, of, of humanity. Okay. And then that's a vast statement, but I believe that's what's missing. You know, what's missing is the ability to speak, communicate, shake hands, make eye contact, create connections, feel beyond yourself. I think that is what's changed over the last 20 years is that everyone looks at life from the camera looking down on their face. You know, no one looks at life from the camera looking out. And it's, it is what it is. And I think when you start thinking about humanity, you get answers to questions that your opinion would tell you aren't true. You know, like, I, I, if you, you gave me an example, I would be able to tell you, or ask me a question, I'd be able to give you a direct example of that. But to me, humanity is just what's lost right now. No one's, no one's thinking about it. And if, if I was going to start a business, it would be a humanity-based business. What makes people feel human? What makes people feel real? Yeah. What makes people feel authentic, cared for, nurtured, loved? That would be my business. It just so happens that my unique deliverable with helping business owners, I think I approach that to a great degree now. Because I believe business owners are the keys, key to the economy, quite frankly. Yeah, they are. I mean, I, I just was doing another recording actually right before this, and we were talking about small small businesses that have gone out of business since COVID in America. We got 100,000 businesses, small businesses that have shut their doors and they're not coming back. Mm -hmm. And small businesses employ about half of Americans. That's right. So to lose 100,000 employment centers, but also 100,000 you know, sources of hope for families and communities and all these things. But I just absolutely love that you have figured out, you know, I was expecting you to say like, well, my passion is to make sure that, you know, every American family is insured properly. You're like, no, my passion is, you know, a defender of humanity. But you have found a way to do that in, because that's not really a job title, right? You know, I mean, it is if you're a superhero. Yeah. You know, but um, you have found a way to take your passion and then insert it into, you know, the holistic financial planning business and help small business owners. So I, I think that's phenomenal that you've done that. No, I appreciate it. I, I just feel like, you know, people don't, <laughs> you know, like I told you the other day, when, he, when, when Superman shows up, he usually shows up to a catastrophe. Yeah. It's a mess. And then what does he do? He finds a way to make that individual feel human by helping them when nobody else was willing to do so. To me, that is the most effective business plan, right? So let's take it back to insurance and financial services. Your insurance guy, he wants to sell you home and auto insurance, great. But your insurance guy has no idea who your, uh, you know, your, your tax advisor is or who your CPA is. 
Mm-hmm. Your CPA has no idea who your attorney is. Nobody's talking to each other. But they're all supposedly helping you without knowing the complete story. Sure. So my unique deliverable is I create a wealth team, a procured wealth team for my small business owners. We help them get to a place to where they can put money that they were previously tipping the federal government with or spending ill-advised for lack of access to advisorship. Mm. And they can now redirect that money towards their next, next best business decision. And so there's something really liberating about knowing that you can do things that Jeff Bezos has done and you can do things that Donald Trump has done as a small business owner and you don't have to get there to figure out how to do. So we're the messenger of the, that type of education to help. And education is really the answer to everything. You know, people need to be more educated about other people's position. You know, people need to be more educated about people's stations, why they, they have. And the only way to do that, like you said, is to be curious and to, be, to ask questions. Uh, as a curious person, mm-hmm. um, you know, something that I do not get to really have conversations about where I am at here, you know, what do you think about reparation? You know, that's a big topic nowadays. There's a lot of, a lot of news and, and spotlight on racial inequalities at the moment. Mm-hmm. You know, what is your opinion, if you don't mind sharing? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's huge. And I, I'd love to, I mean, I think, I think it all goes back to economics. If, if let's think about it from an economic standpoint. If I today hired 30 people and said, hey, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna have you build my organization, but I'm not gonna pay you. I'm gonna feed you the worst possible food possible and I'm gonna work you from sun up to sundown. But you have a place to live, meager accommodations. So I'm gonna benefit from it all and my children are gonna benefit from it all. And you're just going to have to deal with your busted body. When you die, you die. There's no such thing as health insurance. Good luck. You would say that that's unfair. You would say from an economic standpoint that that's unfair. I I would argue you'd probably say that two things happen simultaneously. I sell life insurance because I know that when I die, I'm going to deliver a legacy posthumously to my family. And that legacy is going to provide for certain levels of privilege that I didn't necessarily have because of me, right? Right. Because I was able to create something. Let's call it Rockefeller. Rockefeller was able to create something that beyond his death still exists today through insurance and financial services. So the same is true. If you don't have economic means, you're creating wealth, but you're, run, you're creating wealth for someone else. You're running on a treadmill and you don't have access to the benefit from your labor. Your children won't and their children won't. Mm-hmm. Economics. So what's the answer to the question? The answer is basically we need to educate, in my opinion, black foundational Americans how to use this current economic environment towards their benefit. That's what I believe needs to happen. As far as reparations are concerned, let's go back to humanity. So most people, when they think reparations, they think every black person in America is gonna get some check in the mail. First of all, we have to define who's getting what. It's not the Nigerian individual who moved here in 1971, who shares my skin color, but doesn't share the building of America, the heritage, right? The heritage. No, it's foundational black Americans is why I told you that's what I consider myself because that's a unique differential because we're the ones who, you know, textiles in the North and cotton in the South. We're the ones who created those, those laborious industries. So, so I'm saying that to say, you know, education is key, but if you look at what happened after slavery. A lot of people don't realize this, but the slave owners received reparations. The slave owners received reparations for their lack of income from slaves. And the slaves were left to wander and figure out how to navigate this without the education that was withheld from them. Yeah. So if you look at every, you know, subgroup or ethnic group, that has had some type of atrocity in the United States, there's actually been some level of reciprocity already. 
You look at the Native American community, look at all the legislation that Obama signed when he was in office for Native Americans. You look at, in, in, in Oregon, Native Americans can, can fish and, and, and do things in the wildlife industry that, that other people can't. They're, they have privileges. Um, they have sovereign nations. They have sovereign land in America. Yeah. What is it about slavery? What is it about black people that makes it impossible for people to see some type of economic uh, relief? And it, it shouldn't be some cut, some check cut. I understand the tax code. And what I know is the federal government gives tax positioning for business owners to do things that the federal government might not be able to do. For instance, low economic or low income housing. Mm -hmm. There's tax benefits. Yeah. Solar. Tax benefits. Research and development. There's tax benefits. Pretty much every sector of society that the government would have difficulty administrating, they leave to small business owners. So I believe it's small business owners' responsibility to educate, to train, to provide opportunity to foundational black Americans to help with this problem. To me, that's what reparations look like. Maybe it looks something like, you know, veterans receive a discount and an ease of transition when trying to buy a home. Why not the same for foundational black Americans? Mm -hmm. Student debt. If you look at the ratio of black Americans that have a college degree, the vast majority of us, the vast majority of us, over 90 some odd percent, have large college debts because we didn't have the wealth to pay for college. Mm -hmm. college debt makes it increasingly difficult to own a home. Owning a home is a foundation of wealth. You have to follow the economic thread to see why black Americans are in the financial position that they're in. And if they're in the financial position that they're in, then things like welfare, things that prohibit education, but increased servitude, become more advantageous. I don't think people want to be on welfare. I just think they don't necessarily have the education to help them get out. And in spite of, with welfare, at least they can pay their bills or what semblance. But it does take the dream away. So I want to add the dream back to that theory. And instead of giving, uh, you know, some blanket check without education, we all know what's going to happen there. Let's spend our time focusing on the educational factor and what it's going to take to stimulate black economies so that the dollar stays in black communities a little bit longer. Um, and the federal government needs to do a better job, in my opinion, of addressing the obvious. I'll say one more thing, and I guess I didn't necessarily mean to harp on this, but I think it's something really important to say. There has never been a U.S. president that has had the audacity to say, I'm sorry, getting back to humanity. When we do something wrong to someone, the first step in healing is an apology. Sure. I believe a lot of the pent up frustration in America right now is because there's simply been a failure of leadership from the past 45 presidents to address slavery from a humane standpoint and say it was an atrocity and on behalf of all my fellow Americans and the federal government, I'm sorry for what the result of this was. I don't know why. I don't know why. But it seems to me that that would be the first step, you know. And, and then to have black people walk the earth with continual reminders of the government's inability to say that. You know, you go to, you go to, you go to Germany, you don't see the Nazi symbol, right? You don't see it. You don't see monuments to Nazis saying, oh, this is our history. But in America, people that enslaved and tortured, you see them everywhere. So we have constant reminders. What we should have, if we're truly, truly believed to be Americans, is statues of the liberators. Sure. Statues of those, the Harriet Tubmans, those who liberated our fellow Americans out of a horrible part of our history. Yeah. So again... Maybe a little bit too much humanity for some people to hear, 
especially coming from, from me. But again, I look at everything from the lens of, of education and humanity. And I believe that economic stability is a result of your ability to understand the environment that you're in. And I believe that I have the ability to help a lot of people doing that, primarily black Americans in this environment. Because if I can do it, I know I can help them do it as well. Well, you're doing it well. And um, do you have a, a, a superpower that you consider yourself to have? <laughs> it changes. <laughs> it changes. Um, I would say my, my current superpower is the ability to feel. It's intercession. You know, I don't care who I'm with. I can be with a white veteran who feels abandoned by his country. I can be with a, a black man. Uh, who feels abandoned by his country and I can understand both lenses and I can empathize to a large degree, even feel almost physically their pain um, because I've decided to connect to the humane part of my brain as opposed, which is all internal. It's all how uh, I receive information unfiltered as opposed to receiving a message online or through Facebook or through something else and allowing that mechanism to vampire my energy. It just has to come from the inside. So right now it's my ability to feel uh, people's pain. And there's a lot of people in pain, but I would argue that, that with a little positioning, turning pain into purpose is so easy. Turning pain into so purpose. It's so easy. Because all it is, it's just a decision that you're not going to allow that feeling uh, to do what it's ultimately going to do. You know, everybody successful has a threat of discontent. Everybody I know that's been, that has achieved success has a story similar to mine. Somebody pissed them off. Somebody was racist. But it's what they did with that that helped them make history. Hmm. Right now, there's a lot of pissed off people and there's a lot of pain but they're allowing other people to create the message instead of them doing it for themselves. Instead of them turning it into purpose. Instead of them turning it into purpose. We are being vampired. Our purpose is being vampired by the media. Yeah. That is an excellent message. And really the whole, our whole time together has been nothing but fantastic messages. I appreciate you sharing all of that. I know we're, um, we're wrapping up here. Uh, Got to get on to the next stuff. I know you do. And, um, you know, before we finish, do you have any, you know, final words of wisdom or tidbits, whether it's, you know, financial in nature uh, or, you know, entrepreneurial in nature that you, uh, that you want to leave everybody with? Well, I guess I'll just say, you know, when you're alone and you're laying in bed and your phone's by your bed, it's not, you're not looking at it. Uh, just try to think of what it is that makes you feel the best in helping other people. And no matter what that is, that could be your next million dollar idea. I just think we've got to get back to humanity. We've got to get back to, to helping people. Um, and we can't allow other people to hijack our purpose. We have to be selfish enough to make a conscious, deliberate decision to own it. And to me, that's what entrepreneurship is. It's a choice. That's why it's so unrelenting. And so that's why entrepreneurship is so fierce is because it's a conscious choice to do for yourself. Excellent, excellent advice. Thank you for that. Thank you for all of the words of wisdom, really, and for spending some time with us. Uh, if people want to connect with you, then uh, is there a way to, um, you know, jump online or find you somewhere? Do you have uh, any of that social stuff going on? <laughs> you know I do, but I can't remember any of them right now. I'll just say, actually, go to modewealth.com and the icons in the top right corner, click on them and reach out to me. We'll make sure that we put it in the show notes. And Melvin, thank you again for the time. Absolutely. With us. It has thank been you. a real, real pleasure. And um, we'll let you get back to your day. Awesome. Talk to you soon. 
registered representative of and securities offered through Securities Management and Research, Inc., SMNR. Member FINRA SIPC. Investment advisory services offered through BFC Planning, Inc. Edge and Insurance and Financial Services, Johnson Financial Services, SMNR, American National Family of Companies, and BFC Planning are independent entities. There are risks involved with investing which may include market fluctuation and possible loss of principal value. Particular investments may not be suitable for certain situations. Carefully consider the risks and possible consequences involved prior to making an investment decision. Our firm does not provide legal or tax advice. Be sure to consult with your own legal and tax advisors before taking any action that may have tax implications. Thank you.